Okay, so here we go. Points, lines, and polygons. Now we're working in the uh, the meat and potatoes, the guts, the the uh, the root of all roots here in uh, 3D graphics. How do we draw stuff? How do we build it? How do we construct the geometry that we want to show? Let's find out. We have our regular chapter structure. Hopefully, the repetition helps uh, make things more accessible as you go through. And uh, the first thing to note here is that, gee, we've, we've done some geometry before. And that was in chapter two, geometry primitives. Uh, now we're looking at more. And, and, but wait, there's even more. Uh, we've got to uh, get through two more chapters before the end of the book, before we cover everything in geometry notes, because there's a lot. The good news, though, is that everything we do with geometry is the same. It fits into the scene graph the same. When there's common fields, they have the same meaning. There's a lot of consistency throughout all of this stuff. So I think you will find that uh, all the work you've done to date studying this uh, will pay off and uh, these nodes will be each pretty intuitive. Once we get the basic concept squared away, each one is a variation on a theme. Here's a different way of drawing geometry all the other stuff about appearance, material, textures that we just learned, that applies consistently. Okay, so uh, if we called the other nodes primitives in, in, in that they were primitively defined, very easy to define, oh, give me a box, give me a sphere, give me a, a cone or a cylinder. Well, uh, we might call these the fundamental geometry nodes, the ones that are the basis for almost uh, everything else, uh, all, the, all the key geometry in uh, X3D. So um, index face sets is a, another way of saying triangles. And uh, uh, that is the primary point of what we do in, uh, in most 3D graphics. We're almost always drawing triangles. The rest of it, points and lines, those are nice, those are helpful, definitely good techniques to have, but less frequently used. Nevertheless, the structure is so similar that we do want to uh, cover them together because it does make sense. Another interesting thing about when you get down how to do triangles and other polygons and put them in an index face set, then we can uh, basically represent any other shape you can knock it down to size. And that's important if you're using some different authoring tool because you may have no control over how that 3D tool has put things together, yet when you export or when you take your, the equations or the representation or whatever it is, there's almost always a way to get it back to triangles and then into X3D. Okay, uh, This is uh, such a powerful principle that we've actually used it in our profiles. We have an interchange profile that includes index face set. And because that's such a flexible node, a lightweight browser such as a handheld device could uh, support index face set. And then the problem becomes not, how do I get my giant geometry into such a small device that has simple computation power? It changes it to, oh, I don't care what geometry you have. Let's put it through a data reducer. Let's put it through a decimator. And we turn those fancy schmancy parametric high order uh, abstractly defined shapes into simply piles of triangles. And then that's what we pushed, pushed to the mobile device. That's what we use as an interchange format. And we can go among different tools, different pieces, parts, make it work. All right. So here's our overview then. There are quite a few nodes, and there's quite a few common concepts. So we'll tackle those first, and uh, it will be worth your time to pay attention to those common concepts, because then the rest of the nodes will seem far less obscure and just uh, drop, right in the, drop right into place. So let's look first at triangles, our favorite polygon. Um, why are they our favorite? Because that's what's used by graphics hardware. 
That's what they're optimized for. And if the first three considerations, at least historically, in 3D graphics have been performance, 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 this was the primary technique. Get really, really good at drawing polygon triangles because other polygons may be well or poorly defined. It's possible to have uh, something that is uh, concave or not coplanar. So, for example, I'll, I'll draw something here. Here's an example of a uh, concave polygon. If, we're, uh, if we want to just draw the uh, internal parts, then visually that looks simple enough, but when it comes down to uh, the math, the computation of how do we draw it, it can be much harder. And the computational cost, the expense of figuring out all the possible permutations, the expense of figuring out where might I decimate that to draw, just slows down the drawing process. So uh, this fits in the category of uh, uh, doctor, doctor, my arm hurts when I do that. Okay, easy answer. Uh, the doctor will tell you, don't do that. Uh, yeah, and, and we feel better. So uh, there's our first uh, counter case, why it's that. Another reason, what if the triangle is not planar? Not planar. Well, that's maybe a little hard to draw on here, so let's, uh, let's use a piece of paper here. If we're drawing a, a, a straightforward quadrilateral, okay, fine, that's planar. But now, how do I draw four points where one point is out of the plane? And in fact, what does that look like? And we'll, we'll check some uh, wireframe versions of that later. You could say, well, I can draw the lines this way and they go up and down. But wait a minute, what if we're going to break it into polygons, where do we decide? Where do we, it, it turns out that if, if one point, let's say the, the point with the uh, notch on it here, if we imagine that that was out of the plane and the other three were in the plane, well, I could fold the paper this diagonal or I could fold the paper this diagonal and get the same shape. And so it's ambiguous. There is more than one possibility when you have non planar polygons. This translates into harder to compute, harder to draw, slower, and maybe looks wrong because since it was poorly defined or ambiguous in the first place, what you get may not be what you expect. Okay, so lots of virtues to going towards triangles in how we draw things. Okay, so Quadrilaterals and uh, higher polygons, sometimes we call them n-gons or polygons with n or n-gons. We, uh, we don't want to, typically we don't want to use them. Another thing that can happen where when you first define it and you say, oh my goodness, I know these are all planar because I define the polygon where all the y coordinates are zero. So what if it has 17 vertices on the one polygon? That's a legal flat polygon. And we'll say, yes, indeed, you're right. Thank you very much. And the card will try its very best to draw that. And we'll probably do a pretty creditable job. But what happens when you start rotating that thing? Well, in a perfect world, such as the world of mathematics, that's no problem. In a slightly less than perfect world, let's say the graphics hardware that's at floating point resolution, every time you rotate that, multiply by a pile of sines and cosines to get the right coordinate transformation and rotation, each one of those points is subject to round off error. And guess what? the round off error will not be exactly the same and the points will be slightly out of the plane as their values change. Oh, 
Now who's right? Now who's planar? Now who's polygon? Well, that hurt. I don't want to solve it that way. Instead, taking that outline then of a big polygon, well, I'll just split it out into a skeleton of coplanar, coincident, overlapping, or at least uh, abutting triangles. And then we go, okay, great. It's now coplanar. Let me draw that on here to make that maybe a little more clear. So here's our n-gon. Each one of the points might get knocked out of the plane when we rotate it, giving us a non-planar polygon. So instead we'll say, okay, instead of drawing the one n-gon, I'll draw seven definitely coplanar polygons and they'll be all right next to each other and guess what when you draw those seven you won't be able to tell that it's not a single one visually you won't see it every one of them will draw just perfectly and it'll look great and everybody's happy okay so there's some of the rationale why we work so hard to make things polygons Okay, well, if that seems simple, let's uh, try another curveball here. Single-sided polygons. Oh, yeah, graphic sort of straddles that real world. How do we draw it? And that perfect world of mathematics, where we don't necessarily have to be constrained by reality. In mathematics, it's quite possible to define a polygon with just one side. How do you do that? We just make it so. We go, okay, this polygon has one side. It has three vertices, but only one side counts. There is no other. All right. Well, thank you very much. Perfect conceptual uh, mathematical definition. There it is. Can we do that? Yes. Would we do that? Sure. Why not? Because uh, when's the last time you saw both sides? of a single polygon. When's the last time you saw both sides of a sheet of paper at once? Mm, hold it in front of a mirror, I guess. You could do that. But uh, you couldn't have direct eyeball on both sides. Of, why? Because as soon as you go from one to the other, you're either edge on, not able to see it, or obscuring the other side. Okay? So if you think about that, you go, oh, well, gee, I guess then when I'm drawing a bunch of triangles on the screen, I should only draw the side I have to look at. And that cut my whole task in half instead of trying to draw both sides because uh, it could be difficult to figure that out. Now, I, I have a joke. I might have told this before on camera, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell it anyway just to sort of uh, illustrate this. And the, uh, the notion was uh, th the, th the three guys on the, uh, around the campfire. No, I did tell this. Screw it. I, I just completely blew the timing. So, okay, Jeff, we'll cut that right at the joke, and we'll move right on. The, th the, the punchline was, but how does it know? <laughs> you guys uh, remember that one? I've told you that one already. No, I've doubly blown it. Told you the punchline and not the joke. Okay, so uh, since it can't get worse, we might as well continue. Uh, 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 three guys around the campfire talking about what's the greatest invention in the history of the world. And uh, I thought for sure I told you guys this one. The uh, first one says, "Well, I think it was uh, fire because uh, it brought mankind out of the darkness. Uh, they could cook food. They could keep warm at night." Uh, Okay, the, thank you. The second guy uh, uh, says, well, I think it was the wheel uh, because the wheel led to the Industrial Revolution and how did uh, uh, civilization begin and villages and cities and all of this. The modern world would not be possible without the wheel. And he's going, oh, yeah, the wheel. Okay, and then the third guy says, well, I... I I think the greatest 
invention in the history of the world was, was the thermos bottle. Thermos bottle. Well, well, why is that? And well, because it keeps hot things hot and cold things cold. And they're going, okay, you know, there's always a third guy in these jokes, you know. So, the, okay, the third thermos bottle, yeah. hot things hot, cold things cold. Yeah. But sorry, we don't we don't get it. Why? Why? Why was that so important? Because ah, how does it know? Okay, so there was a terrible, terrible joke. I hope you never tell that. But if you do, you probably can do no worse than I, than I just did right here. Uh, so, yes, it sounds good on the face of it. Uh, would I just draw, which, let's just draw half of them, the sides we can see, because then we're not drawing things and throwing out stuff that we can't see. How does it know? Well, that's, that's the magic of computational geometry. How do we compute that? We'll see you in a minute. How do we do it? The key here in single-sided polygons is uh, it's a good idea. If we can, and so if we, if we're able to, let's try to facilitate uh, tools, uh, <laughs> facilitate our models so that that's easily done. And as authors, we actually gain control of that. Uh, X3D lets you decide as the author if a polygon should be single-sided or double-sided so that the computational geometry, the, the hardware, doesn't have to know. It doesn't have to figure it because you just told it. You said, this is single-sided, so it can immediately go, okay, I'm not looking at that side. I don't have to draw anything. All right. There is a technical term for this. You know, we can't charge the big bucks unless we have the jargon. It's called backface culling, meaning the face opposite, the back face, gets culled or thrown out. Okay. Now the way we do that, the setting we use for that is right here, solid parameter. And we'll see in a minute the details of how solid works. Okay, what else is a key concept here? Normal vectors. How do we compute the normal, in other words, the perpendicular to a face of a polygon. And so that normal is uh, actually uh, rigorously defined. There's a, a good algorithm for this that tells you how to do it. And it's, it's repeatable and understandable. So let's look at it. Here it is in the next picture. Imagine, if you will, we've got this uh, uh, triangle on the left. And notice very carefully the ordering of the vertices on there. Since you're writing them out in a file, or in your program, you do have to put them in a row. So there will be an order of how they're defined. If we take our good old right-hand rule and apply it here, and we go from vertex 0 to 1 to 2, the curve of your right hand pointing as you go up, the, thumb, uh, the palm being the zero point going around, then that gives you the side that's the positive normal vector. Okay. What exact direction? Oh, the perpendicular. Since a triangle defines a plane, that plane has a perpendicular vector, and uh, so the centroid would be the particular location about it. What we most care about is what's the front side? So we use the right-hand rule to define the positive normal vector is the front side. The negative normal vector, meaning the vector in the opposite direction, would be the back face. And so this is how we decide which side is which. So if we say, well, how nice as authors, back to the single-sided polygon, if as authors we have control of that, how do we know? How do we know which is the front side or the back side? Well, if it's an individual triangle, you use the right-hand rule. If it's a set of triangles, you could use the right-hand rule on each one, and you'd have to be very careful in your definition of the triangles that they pointed the right way. If it's a primitive, such as a box or a sphere, well, it's pretty obvious what the inside and the outside is. So you would say, well, as long as my camera is not going inside, I would never need to draw the inside. 
Okay, so that's how you know where to put your back face going. And that's how we figure out using the normals to make it work. We'll see uh, more about normals in the uh, triangles chapter, uh, triangles and quadrilaterals, which is uh, chapter 13. Okay, uh, next field. Again, common to most of the geometry nodes. Wherever it makes sense, we use the same fields to help uh, describe them. And this is CCW counterclockwise. And uh, Jeff, we need a little uh, uh, camera action here, please. Uh, let's look at the clock. Oh, okay, uh, it's uh, 6.30. So here's our clock face. It's clockwise, counterclockwise, of course, is opposite. So let's see, right hand rule, clock face. Oh, counterclockwise would be the positive, regular right hand rule. So it's frankly what we would expect if we looked at a clock, the front face of a clock, and say, what is our positive normal? That would be coming out because we can see it. We go, oh, okay, so counterclockwise simply matches our default expectation of reality. And this is why we don't just lapse into clockwise as our default. Instead, counterclockwise makes sense as a positive normal. So how do we define that? Is uh, Well, there it is. True is the right-hand rule. False is opposite. OK? And so occasionally you'll find, uh, most of the time you'll find you don't have to worry about it. Just leave it alone. You don't have to touch it. But occasionally you'll find that flipping that will expose your geometry, where it might be turned inside out, you know, or it might be inconsistent in some parts. Some parts are showing you the outline, but the other is sort of flipped around, so it's only visible from the inside. This is especially prevalent if you're converting data from other formats, other models, other tools. So this would give you control of that. Okay, so it can save some time. Um, next field, color per vertex versus uh, whether that's true versus false. Okay, so color per vertex would be uh, shown pretty clearly on these two examples. Uh, the left hand two are most obvious, where if we have a different color for each vertex, and in this case, we are using a quadrilateral as our polygon, then uh, you can get different color blending going on. We just defined four colors for this. We didn't define a whole gradation, but we assigned four independent colors to the four corners, and then we see, aha, the uh, colors got blended and merged across. Interesting effect. Whereas in the, the red square, we simply defined one color, color per vertex false, and that means that color was applied to the polygon. Okay? So it's either per point or per polygon on here. A little harder to see, but definitely there, depending on your printer or screen, is uh, the corresponding squares for an index line set on, on the left. So here we have the uh, uh, colored version of that, and here we have the color per vertex version, and then on the right hand side we have the individual colored side. Okay, uh, next up. Example. So uh, this is our color per vertex example scenes where we find that, so let's pull that up in X3D Edit. And let's see how we're doing for time here. Okay. All right, so we're in Chapter 6. Color per vertex example. There it is on the left. I'm rotating it now. You can see, sure enough, those are flat polygons. Also, we can see that the polygons are single-sided. As we rotated around them, there was nothing there. 
whereas the lines were viewable from each direction. In the uh, slides, Here we go. The, uh, the slide shows that there are four nodes of interest here that to define those. First we had uh, index face set. The first one, second one's also an index face set. Sometimes we abbreviate those. Shorthand would be IFS. Uh, maybe not speaking, but writing an email or something like that. And then we had a couple of index line de sets. Uh, or ILS. The index face and index line sets are the primary workhorse nodes. We also see that there is a color node in there that corresponds to our coordinate definitions. So we have coordinate definition and color definition for each one. And uh, when you read the fine print on the example or in the slides, we can see that uh, home back here. We can see that this is uh, consistently defined over and over again. Okay, so let's drill down a little more then into this example. Uh, well, let's view it one more time too. I'll undock our image and let's take one more look at that front side, back side business. Rotating, rotating and boom. We can be right on edge and not see the polygon and not see the polygon on its far side when it's gone around. So definitely single-sided polygons. Okay, so that's actually probably a uh, uh, good place to break. Let's review where we're at. We've gotten through uh, some of the primary fields. Next up, we're gonna look at uh, convex and crease angle and then uh, work our way through the notes. See you then.